I mean, you want to record it. it right now. Yeah. All right. Okay. Watch what I say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I literally did nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Van Matt had everything under control. Oh, okay, cool. So okay. Kim, just let me know when you wanna yeah. get started. Let's 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 proceed. Yep. All right, perfect. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Van Manen. I don't think I recognize all the different names aside from Kim, of course. Um, in the participant or, or chat box. Uh, Kim, there's about 10 students you expect today, right? Yeah, so it's, it's always a mixture of medical students and regular students. There are 25 medical students associated with the course, but we never get more than like two to four at any, any one time. And Simon, is a TA who took the course some time ago, has taught in the course and so on. And then we, we have a lot of families taking the course. So Miss Ba is here and her sister all, also takes the course. And then Poo, uh, Pusha is from Nepal, has come back and has a long experience with the course. So you've got a variety of people who were here for the first time or have been here many times. Yeah, so it's a mixed group, yeah. Sounds perfect. <laughs> okay. um, so like I said, my name is Michael Van Manen. I am a neonatologist. So that means that I work in newborn intensive care as a physician and I take care of babies born premature. Uh, those with congenital anomalies or those who experience some kind of medical complications or issues around the time of birth. I'm also the director of the John Doster Health Ethics Center and um, I try and maintain an active research program uh, related to relational ethics, ethics of technology, and ethics in critical care. I'm a very casual person. So if you could see me right now, you'd see I was wearing jeans and I'm sitting in the office relaxed. So I absolutely love it when people jump in with questions and comments. Uh, please feel free if I'm talking for too much uh, or something isn't making sense, uh, just unmute your microphone and ask away or type a comment into the chat box and I'll do my best to keep on it as well. I put up the link for the Doster Health Ethics website. Um, I can certainly share these slides after the presentation if that's helpful for you. Um, we have almost weekly seminars and workshops going on and we always welcome interested students or others uh, to attend. So please feel free to join us. I was talking really briefly um, with Simon as we were waiting to get started today just about so what are you talking about Michael like what is what's the focus for today and I'm going to be giving two sessions for this class uh, this is more of a broad introduction to health ethics but I still want to ground it in concrete kind of clinical material um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the ethics we run into in the newborn intensive care ethics is something that I think we all encounter whether we're healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, social workers, whether we're researchers, whether we're parents or just members of the community. But we tend to take ethics for granted. So if you really think about it, if you really kind of put yourself on the spot, I'd like to ask you, what is ethics? How do you understand the meaning of ethics? Related to this course, what do you see as significant ethical questions for the future of medicine? How do the ethics of technology relate to the ethics of medicine? Do we anticipate the qualities that exemplify what makes an ethical nurse, physician, social worker, or other healthcare provider to change over time? 
in our increasingly technological world or our world that has always already been technological, depending on your perspective. And for people like me who are on call today at four o'clock, what is the role of ethics in actual clinical practice? So I'm hoping these are the kind of questions that you'll think about during this presentation and maybe also come to realize that they're, they're complicated questions that can preoccupy one for their entire career. These are my five take home points. They're also serving as the objectives for this talk. So the first is ethics is always already present in our day-to-day -day interactions. The second is the proto-ethical question asks, what is going on to which I must now respond? The third, moral consciousness expresses intersubjectivity, historicity, temporality, purpose, meaning, and freedom as constitutive elements which is all the more important when we're talking about technology and ethics. That varying moral perspectives locate morality differently, serving as heuristics to evaluate actions. And ultimately it is reflection and discussion that can support moral actions, recognizing there's often more than one morally acceptable option that one can take. Sound okay? It's the one thing I love about Zoom. If no one has a camera on, I can just assume everyone is nodding their head in agreement. It's fabulous. So I wanted to start off with a case, and this is a case that's published in an article by Annie Jean Vier, um, Arlo and Barrington. So Canadian researchers in neonatology and ethics. And it's regarding the situation that we're increasingly finding ourselves in. And that is, what are the limits of medical interventions? What are the limits of medical technology? Ought medicine to recognize that it has limits? And what set one such situation is in the care of babies or children with complex congenital anomalies genetic syndromes, or other kind of medical complexity. So I'll read you the little description they wrote uh, for this article, and it's on a child named Danny. During their first pregnancy, Simone and Gregory uh, Alterbach were told that the first trimester screen was abnormal. So in pregnancy, uh, mothers are generally encouraged to have different tests and investigations done to look for any possible medical issues with the mom, as well as potentially medical issues with the child as well. And this case, something called a first trimester screen was done. And that looks for conditions like trisomy. The diagnosis was trisomy 18. Sorry, the diagnosis of trisomy 18 was made at 15 weeks gestation after an amniocentesis. So a needle put into the mom's abdomen, a sample of uh, fluid withdrawn, sent for genetic analysis, and trisomy 18 was identified. This is a condition where a baby's born with an extra chromosome, in this case, the 18th chromosome. The couple decided to continue the pregnancy and named their unborn son Danny. So before we even seen their child, the bad news continued coming with every appointment. So we're qualifying trisomy 18 as bad news, and we'll talk about why that may or may not be appropriate language. Daniel had esophageal atresia. Club feet and the latest heart ultrasound revealed a severe form of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So these are three um, congenital anomalies, the first and third being quite severe. Now at 31 weeks gestation, Daniel only weighs 900 grams. So usually at 31 weeks, we'd expect the baby to weigh around 1,500 grams. So this baby's small, showing no fetal growth in the past two weeks. And when we hear about a baby not growing before birth, we're usually concerned that there may be problems with the baby getting enough oxygen and other nutrients from the placenta. So this is a situation of a baby potentially in, in trouble before birth. 
sorry, I'm trying to animate this case as we go along because I recognize not all of you are, are in medicine. So a little bit more about trisomy 18 and these congenital anomalies to hopefully contextualize the situation. So trisomy 18 is one of the most common anecdotes, meaning a difference in chromosome number. I suspect the most common anecdote that you've heard about would be trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So this is a different condition, but a trisomy nonetheless. In the past, and I would say the recent past, trisomy 18 has been considered universally, universally legal. So just the last edition of newborn resuscitation or NRP would identify that this is a condition which is lethal. Many babies or fetuses who are identified to have trisomy 18 actually pass away before birth. So about 70% of pregnancies carrying a baby with trisomy 18, uh, the baby passes away before birth. And survival in the first year of life is generally described as unlikely. What am I mean by unlikely? Only 10% survive. The majority dying from respiratory or cardiovascular etiologies. Heart defects affect up to 60 to 80% of infants with trisomy 18, so it's common. And they can have other congenital anomalies as well, affecting their limbs, their nervous system, their gastrointestinal tract, or their urinary tract. I suspect if, if you were to read this to most pediatricians, they would say, yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. But one point that I think needs to be kind of drawn out is this survival in the first year of life is described as unlikely. And what we've learned increasingly is that survival is unlikely if you don't treat the congenital anomalies of the children are born. In that situation, yes, the survival is probably only 10%. But in situations where heart surgery, gastrointestinal surgery, and other interventions are pursued, then the survival becomes much higher. In other words, survival isn't just a chance, it rather reflects the kind of decisions that parents and healthcare providers make as far as what is reasonable care. So I talked to you about a few congenital anomalies. So this baby is born with esophageal atresia. That means when the esophagus was forming, the tube that connects your mouth to your stomach, it wasn't formed as a complete tube. Rather, there was a fistulous connection between the trachea and the esophagus. So if the baby tries to swallow, food won't go into the tummy. Rather, it will be dislodged into the airways and lungs. So this isn't a situation generally considered compatible with unless surgery is done. I also mentioned this baby was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome or was diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. That means that the left side of the heart, so the side of the heart that pumps blood to the body, the left ventricle, wasn't formed normally. It can't accommodate a normal volume of blood. So the only way that the body gets adequate blood flow is through something called a PDA or persistent ductus arteriosus, which is, uh, you could think of it as an extra vessel that all babies are born with that normally closes after birth. But in the context of babies with this heart condition, if that vessel is allowed to close without surgery being done, they, they pass away. So, Two lethal anomalies are, are present in this baby, but they're only defined as lethal based on whether we pursue surgery for them. If you Google trisomy 18, you'll come up with a lot of images like this, and it will generally disclose or shape an understanding of trisomy 18, which is viewed from a medical perspective. In fact, I think I might have used even one of these images when I was studying for my board exams in pediatrics, because you had to memorize all of the things that were wrong with this child. Right? It reflects almost a normative bias.
But increasingly, over the last years, we've seen images and websites like this appear. I love someone with trisomy 18, fighting for my imperfectly perfect daughter with trisomy 18. National Trisomy 18 Awareness Day. There's a trisomy 18 support group for parents who want help advocating for their child with trisomy 18. Just this past year, we had surveillance guidelines published for babies with trisomy 18, which acknowledges that some of these children will grow up to be adolescents and potentially young adults. But sure enough, they grow up differently, right? Differently in the sense of different from the population norm because they are born different, right? With an extra chromosome and other medical conditions, some of which may be disabling. But there becomes a question of how do we handle these kind of situations? And if I were to try and answer for you, what is health ethics? I would say that health ethics deals with these kind of questions and concerns. Right? So a few ethical questions that might come from this case. What are the ethics of expecting a child with a genetic difference? What might it be like to receive a prenatal diagnosis as a family? What is it that we give in the diagnosis? Are we giving just an explanation of anatomic or clinical or medical findings? Or are we also giving a certain sense of what is a normal life or what is a life that's worth saving? What does it mean to conceptualize genetic difference as disorder, right? What are the ethics of being a healthcare provider in such situations? Knowing the relationship between healthcare providers and families and patients is one that's asymmetrical. There's different power differentials here, right? Physicians often know a great deal more about navigating the healthcare system than their patients. Although increasingly, many patients, I would say, know more than their healthcare providers, particularly when they're invested in their own healthcare condition. What role do healthcare providers have in decision making? Are we merely technicians able to perform different tasks at the requests of families and patients? Or do we have certain normative responsibilities to counsel towards certain directions? Should doctors simply offer decision makers choices? Should they offer recommendations, right? So in the situation presented, should they offer a recommendation to terminate the pregnancy? Should they offer a recommendation that after delivery, palliative care should be pursued, knowing that a child born extremely preterm with trisomy 18 and complex congenital heart disease is extremely unlikely to survive, even in the context of medical interventions offered. And if the baby does survive, is likely to be in hospital for at least a year of their life. How do we navigate personal, religious, fiscal, social, and political perspectives in medicine? What are the ethics of healthcare resource use? What is the role of anticipations of lethality and futility in such situations? Do the ethics of resuscitating and caring for babies with trisomy 18 change in the context of a pandemic where it might use up our last critical care bed? Or can we just make more and more critical care beds and nurses and doctors and everything else, just like our government says? How do we come to terms with the significant health resources that children with medical problems are afforded compared to those with social problems? Right. So we have children within Edmonton each day who go to school without a lunch or having not eaten breakfast. Right. As a society, we don't seem prepared to pay those families a so-called living wage, right? But we are prepared to keep a child alive in, in hospital for a year, spending 
frankly, over millions of dollars? What are the ethics of action and inaction? So what is the meaning of doing something compared to doing nothing as a parent or a healthcare provider? What does it mean to be a good parent? What does it mean to be a good doctor? What are the ethics of orienting towards cure? How do we pathologize difference, syndromes, anomalies, the normative bias of medicine? What do we see medical care having in supporting life and living? Am I making anyone's head hurt? Everyone's okay? We're fine. We're, we're enjoying learning. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Kim. I'm trying to throw you into kind of this context of, of ethics because there's different perspectives of ethics. One perspective sometimes is, well, this is all about philosophy, right? It involves sitting in, in a room and studying different books and texts, right? Um, it doesn't have any real world relevance. But on the other hand, if you actually work in this environment, I can say, you know, ethics is, is what we have to deal with every single day when we're involved in the care of others. So now I'm hoping to go through these take home points. Before I do that, are there, are there any questions that people had about that case I presented? My reason for presenting it was mainly to get you thinking rather than to necessarily tell you what you should do in the situation of expecting a child with trisomy 18. I want to be clear about that. Okay. So ethics is always already present in our day-to-day -day interactions. So what is ethics? Can we come up with a definition or a phrase or some other kind of shared understanding that, yeah, this is what ethics is. This is what we're, we're talking about today. I'm gonna start off by showing you some different pictures, each of which to me disclose ethics, all right? To me, these images of, you know, in vitro plant in IVF <laughs> and an ultrasound of a newborn baby expresses an ethics. It expresses a way of regarding or looking at someone other than ourselves. And with it, we begin to think of them in a particular way and other individuals or things may become absent, right? So to give you an example, here we're oriented to this face of a child, right? That expresses an ethics. What we've, we've also done is made invisible the fact that this baby is situated within another, situated within its mother. So what are we seeing, but what are we also failing to see? This is another image of ethics. It's actually on the cover of uh, one of the books I wrote. Um, and it depicts a six week old girl um, who's being held by her father uh, after she's had heart surgery done. You can see the little sternotomy scar and her mom is also holding her, holding her head ever so gently. And to me, this shows ethics because I think it makes us wonder or it ought to make us wonder what is this child's life like, right? This baby is in many ways the subject of intensive care or newborn intensive care. We're constantly making decisions that affect him or her, but they don't necessarily have a voice in what treatments or interventions they receive or fail to receive. Instead, we're always left wondering, what is their life like? Recognizing that a newborn's apprehension of the world is very different from an adult's, right? And I know we have people here with backgrounds in, um, in neurology or neuroanatomy or neurophysiology. Oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the term already. I'm sorry, Simon. And you could probably tell us all the differences that happen in maturation in a newborn's brain compared to an adult's. But if I were to say, well, what does a newborn actually perceive in this moment? It might be actually hard to quantify that. 
it's apt to say that this baby seemingly has some kind of conscious existence, even if it is one that might be a different conscious existence to adults who reflect and articulate what their experiences are of. This image also shows ethics, right? This is a woman with Alzheimer's. I think it's from the Alzheimer's Association, right? What is that kind of a life like? One where you may not be able to remember one moment from another. One where different individuals who previously were familiar now become strange, right? I think every year we kind of talk a little bit about animal ethics in this class. And, you know, we're all too ready to talk about kind of speciesism in the sense of, you know, regarding um, humans as all deserving of, of rights and our obligations and responsibilities towards them because they're part of this same class, right? But what about other members of our species who may also have some form of a subjective grasp of the world, right? Who may be able to experience pain or isolation or suffering. What are our ethical responsibilities to them? I would be amiss this week, not to at the very least point to the situation in Ukraine as a situation expressing ethics. What ethics if any, is Putin demonstrating? Is he showing? What are the ethics of the international response or failure to respond to his aggression? This image too shows ethics, a picture of the landscape uh, in Northern Alberta, um, you know, where we engage in mining. If we talk about our caring regard for, you know, the vulnerable animal, the newborn child, um, the, the frail elderly woman, where is our regard for the world around us that we're all too ready able to carve up as a resource to treat it as a standing reserve, right? What kind of ethics does this image display with regard, our regard to what is, other to ourselves, yet we're nonetheless dependent on. So if you really, really had to push me and said, Michael, what is a definition for ethics? I'd wanna be able to respond in this way. And I would say that ethics is founded in a concern for whom or what is other to ourselves. We deal with ethical situations when we're dealing with decisions that don't just affect us, right? If I have to decide, oh, should I or should I not have ice cream tonight um, before going to bed? That doesn't really affect others. Unless I'm like, oh, should I or should I not have that last bit of ice cream knowing that my youngest son is really looking forward to it tomorrow night, then it becomes an ethical situation because it's concerning someone who's more than just me. And because we live in a social world, we're constantly confronted with ethics. I never miss an opportunity to quote my favorite philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, right? Uh, so a French philosopher whose first, not first, but one of his major texts, Totality and Infinity, this is a quote from it. Ethics is an optics. It's a vision without image bereft of the synoptic and totalizing objectifying virtues of vision, a relation of an intentionality of a wholly different type. So for loving us, ethics is the other in the sense of encountering what is other to ourselves and can't be reduced to the magnitude of the same. But ethics also has a normative dimension to it. And if you haven't read it, it's, it's a very short writing by, by Wittgenstein, a lecture on ethics. It's, it's one of those kind of documents that or text people should read. And he describes their ethics as the inquiry into what is valuable or into what is really important 
the inquiry into the meaning of life or into what makes life worth living or into the right way of living. Meaning not only is ethics about what is good, sorry, about what is other, but it also comes back to this sense of, is this right or is it wrong? How does it sit with me? In that way, ethics is always dealing with what is meaningful. So I'm hoping I've convinced you of this first point, or at least made you begin to question or think about it, that we're constantly dealing with ethics, even if we're not constantly dealing with so-called ethical dilemmas. Any questions before I move on? Okay. The proto-ethical question asks, what is going on to which I must now respond? So one way of presenting ethics, which I by and large resist doing, is presenting so-called quandary ethics. Quandary ethics essentially presents situations and says, what is the ethical thing to do? And this is a picture of the so-called trolley experiment. And the trolley experiment goes somewhat like this. Imagine a trolley coming down the tracks, maybe coming down the hill. And ahead, there is a fork in the tracks. There are two choices. A man is standing beside a switch, sorry, a person is standing beside a switch. And they can flick the switch and the trolley can be diverted from its current track to go to a secondary tract. Or that individual cannot flick the switch, in which case the trolley will continue on ahead. This is actually a consequential decision for this individual. Why? Because someone has laid out individuals and tied them to these railroad tracks. And there isn't enough time to loosen their, their ropes and free them from the situation they're in. So what is the right thing to do? Is the right thing to do nothing, not flip the switch, and then trolley goes down and runs over these five individuals? Or ought the person to flick the switch and you know, save the lives of five at the expense of one, right? And there's other versions of this story. There's also one that's called, I think it's like the fat man or something like that. Basically the idea is rather than a switch, you know, should this person push this onlooker from the top of a bridge knowing that they will then block the trolley from going any further and save the lives of these individuals, but be injured or killed in the, in the prospect. And then there's, there's other ones as well. Um, the reason I try not to present ethics in this way is because it's very easy to, for ethics to become more and more abstract, where we're simply saying, well, is engaging or not engaging in action in and of itself ethically different, right? Is it better to save more than a few people? Instead of actually asking, what might it be like to be an individual in these particular situations? Which reveals ethics, I would say, more richly. So while these are interesting thought experiments, and if you like this kind of thing, there's actually a whole bunch of them on this uh, website, uh, uh, Philosophex, which, which if you just Google it, you'll see a bunch of different videos. But for me working in health, this is a much more apt description of ethics, or it shows ethics more fully. Because the ethical question asks, what's going on to which I must now respond? What is it like for this loved one to be sitting in bed beside, to be sitting beside some loved one, we assume, right, who may be quite ill, right? What is it like for the healthcare nurse or our other attendant in this situation? What's it like for the patient? If we want to get a better sense of how to respond to a situation, we shouldn't necessarily just try and become more abstract, but we actually need to become more concrete to gain a sense of what might different individuals' subjective grasps 
be of this situation. So this is where Carl Schrag came up with this question of ethics is dealing with having to answer the question, what is going on here to which I must now respond? So the ethical demand is I have to respond to this situation, but I first need to better understand what is it that's going on that I feel myself compelled to respond to. And hopefully then I can find a more fitting response to what's going on in the situation. So if we want to have a better sense of understanding what's going on, we have to think a little bit about this notion of moral consciousness, meaning how is it that we experience something as being good or experience something as being bad? So roughly, one can say that moral philosophy um, or ethics is a socio-cultural phenomenon, right? Meaning that what is defined as good or what is defined as bad changes potentially over time. And we see that when we look back in history, even when we look back in older movies from the 80s and the 90s and we realized, oh, I can't show that anymore to my kids or I can't watch that movie anymore because things have changed. It's not okay to say things that way anymore. Right? It's not okay to behave that way anymore. There is a sociocultural element to ethics. Right? I like this definition from uh, Franco Carnevale, who's uh, a nurse, research, nurse researcher in Eastern Canada. And he describes moral experience as a person's sense that the values he or she deems important are being realized or thwarted in everyday life. That's how ultimately we have a sense of whether something is, is good or bad. So for him, moral experience is subjective, meaning it comes from a particular individual's viewing of the world, which is shaped by their embodiment of the world. But it's also hermeneutic in the sense that there are sense-making aspects to this. We make sense of an experience as being or good or bad. It isn't necessarily good and bad in and of itself. So we can say that moral consciousness is structured by an intersubjective intentionality. And this is a bit of a philosophical term from um, you know, Brentano and Husserl and other phenomenologists where intentionality means my directedness to the world, how it is that I am conscious of something, right? So clearly um, I am conscious of things in a different way visually than someone who may be visually impaired. They may see things differently, right? And in fact, me saying they're visually impaired actually discloses certain biases of what is a normal vision. But we can also imagine other things have a different way of understanding the world around them. And I'm hoping you can now begin to think, well, if this class is about different kinds of technologies in the future of medicine, we can actually also design and create different kinds of cyborgian or machine-like intentionality, right? So a computer program for a way may actually encounter the world in a different way based on how we program it to detect its input. A moral self is a historical self. So to it exist historically means to be in a process of arriving from a past and moving into a future, right? So we make sense of something as being good or bad, not just in this moment, this precise moment of the now, but rather in this moment of a now, that we anticipate, right? That as we start to think about it already drifts into our past because our existence is temporal, right? We're not tied to a single moment in time. We're constantly recovering from a past and moving into a future. So it makes sense our moral experience of the world is also one that's temporal. Connected to that, we can say that moral experiences have a retentional character tied to the past and potentially qualified what is yet to be experienced. Right. 
to exist morally is to live with purpose. And I don't mean purpose in the sense of I have a purpose. Before I um, go to bed tonight, I'm going to do 100 push-ups, right? Um, I mean purpose more broadly in the sense of purpose as a compelling element in this living future, conditioning the actions for the present and determining the significance of the past, right? So we look backwards with a view towards the future and in turn interpret the significance of the past in this moment of the now, right? And that's why sometimes we don't realize a particular moment or event in our life was as meaningful as it was until some point in the future, right? Because we're constantly interpreting the past and arriving at a new understanding of its significance. The moral self envisions the achievement of a meaningful life or a meaningful mode of existence. Meaning as a moral category, structuring moral experience indicates a condition of self unification or self integration. A meaningful life is a unified life, a life unified in hope and in memory. We seem to struggle with situations where there is lacking consistency, where one situation was deemed as being right and another was wrong, but we don't understand how the context differs between the two. Right? We're trying to make sense of things in a unified way. Right? The freedom of the moral self is a finite, finite freedom, limited by finite existential time and existential space in which moral actualization occurs. So this is this notion of that we as humans actually do have limitations with respect to our consciousness, with respect to how we make sense of the world, right? Um, there are aspects of life around us that we don't see, right? None of us sees like individual molecules or ions, unless you're watching, I guess, some TV show like Raising Dion or something, right? Like your, our embodiment in the world structures what we see and how the world is present to us. So if we now begin to think technologically, um, I'm hoping that people can begin to now think that when we begin engaging in acts of creation, acts of design, right? In producing different kinds of technologies, particularly if we imagine those technologies having some kind of sentient existence, that what is deemed as right or wrong by them is going to be a structure or going to be an effect of how they morally grasp the world around them, right? I really like the, uh, love the first season of Westworld. I'm hoping all of you had a chance to see it. But this idea of um, when the, um, the so-called robots or, or whatever they were called at the park begin to develop the ability to remember, right? Um, to be able to have a sense of the past, suddenly there began to be this evaluative sense. But that isn't to say that their subjective, subjective grasp of the world was necessarily the same as the, the humans, right? So we have to take some kind of responsibility for the subjective experiences that we create for our technologies and potentially that they create for themselves. It's much easier to talk about ethics and morality from a machine or technical perspective if you make them within our own image, right? Um, so this is a, uh, course, a nice image from Raised by Wolves. I think it's in its second or third season as well, right? Um, you know, creating this, um, you know, art, artificial life, which is then given the task to, to raise these humans, right? Which essentially are, 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 are born in a, um, not in a womb, right? She never carries the children in that way, but born from these devices. And of course, this famous scene um, from, from the first Matrix, right? Which begins to challenge this notion of um, if we're talking about moral experience and ethics, 
we sometimes seems to have this fear that we're going to create some kind of technological super entity, a singularity that is going to come back and judge us for our actions, right? And we judge it potentially as being wrong or immoral based on our own subjective grasp of it, right? But if we were to look at our own ways of acting in the world, one where we use other kind of sentient life, for example, animals, and we use them as livestock for our own nourishment, what gives us the right to judge you know, some future life for using us in the same way if we are considered more primitive compared to um, what we're currently doing um, to those more primitive, so-called primitive uh, species around us. Okay. So I'm sorry, maybe that got a little bit philosophical and a little bit out in the air, but I I'm trying to, in, the, in this first session on ethics, really get you to appreciate the complexity of what ethics is and actually the, the wideness of its domain. Um, ethics and health isn't just about respecting the autonomy of the patient, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Yes, those are the four principles that you often hear referred to in codifications of ethics, like the um, you know, code of ethics by the Canadian Medical Association. But ethics has to do with so much more on a fundamental level. It has to do with how it is we appreciate others in the world around us, right? How we make sense of what their experiences of the world are like without reducing them to our own. And also how we actually form a sense of what is right and what's wrong. So I wanted to present a few different moral perspectives at this point, just to give you, you could say some heuristic tools for how one can begin to reflect on or question, is this good or is this bad? And the perspectives I'm gonna to refer to are deontological perspectives, consequentialist perspectives, character, communitarian, contractual, and society. So I'm gonna slow down here and I'm hoping that if there's any questions, we can make sure we go through them. So what is a deontological perspective to morality or to ethics? So a deontological perspective is sometimes referred to as obligation, duty, or rule-based ethics. So here, what is considered right or what is considered wrong is based on how it conforms to what binds it, right? So the most striking or common example we think about with deontological ethics would be um, you know, things like the Ten Commandments in the Bible. If one of the commandments of the Bible is do not kill, and I engage in killing, then I've now engaged in a bad act or a wrong act because I haven't conformed to that rule, right? So what is right and what is wrong is judged based on the rules that essentially are explicated. Knowing that there may be different rules and different faiths, and not all individuals turn to a faith for particular rules about how to live. Now there becomes a problem because one can ask, well, what rules ought to guide our behavior? Who are you to say that I should honor my father and mother? Maybe the rule should instead be honor thy grandfather and the grandmother, or maybe one doesn't owe certain obligations to one parents, right? Who makes these decisions? So a famous deontologist is Immanuel Kant, and his first formulation described as the categorical imperative basically says that one should act only to the maximum, whereby you can at the same time will, it should become universal law. So the principles that we ought to follow, those obligations, those duties, those rules, are the ones that we would expect others to follow as well, right? So um, 
I should not kill if that is what I would expect and want all those others in my community to follow as well, right? That's what gives it grounding as being good because I would will that others would wanna follow it as well. Other examples of deontological perspectives are the principles of biomedical ethics. I mentioned these already, the idea of um, respecting autonomy, so the independence of the patient, doing good, beneficence, avoiding harm, non-maleficence, and being equitable or just or fair um, to groups of patients or society at large, which relates to justice. And these four principles essentially were articulated um, for the practice of medicine uh, over the course of reflection on events that had happened in, in medical practice and research uh, around the world wars and again in the years following. And that's, we don't really have time to go into that, but if you're interested in there's, there's much to be learned from, from the history of medicine by looking at its history. So in deontology, we can ask, um, questions about, you know, what is the dual or rule, duty or rule that I should follow? And what deontology is often contrasted with is consequentialist perspectives of ethics. And here we take the consequence of an act as the ultimate basis for moral judgment. So it doesn't necessarily matter whether I followed a particular principle or not. It's rather what ended up being achieved. That should justify whether ultimately my actions can be considered as good or bad. The famous kind of phrase around consequentialism that's made its way, of course, in, in, into media and discussions is the end justifies the means, right? So we can't look to the principles, we have to look at the end in and of itself. Utilitarianism names a family of consequentialist ethical series, rhetorizing that what end we're trying to achieve might be desired differently. So for some uh, hedonistic perspectives, the end we should try and achieve is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. And this is the how we judge an action as being as being good or not. It will be okay if some people weren't happy if we can say overall the greatest number of people were happy to the greatest extent. But there are other kind of ends that we can look towards maximizing, things like utility, right, well-being, or some related consequence. A contemporary example of consequentialism in action is the right action is the one that saves the most lives possible, right? And that is the phrase that was turned to, of course, by um, our government and others in the context of rationalizing different uh, public health measures and other actions for the COVID-19 pandemic. Any questions about those two? Okay. So how about character-based perspectives? Um, so here, um, rather than looking at the ends or looking at the principles, we're instead making a judgment or looking at the person, their characteristics their so-called virtues. Um, this is often finds its roots within kind of the Greek world, right? And for Greeks, this notion of excellence was bound up with the notion of fulfillment of purpose or function, or the act of living up to one's potential, right? So, you know, honesty, one lives up to, and it's realized through action. The kind of person we are goes hand in hand with the actions that we pursue to the extent that a virtuous person acts virtuously in their nature, their actions fulfill their purpose. So if we're wondering what to do or what would be the right thing to do in a particular situation, we can take a character based perspective, rather than asking what end are we trying to achieve, but rather asking what would a good physician do in this situation? What would Dr. So-and-so do, who we all regard as a, as a good physician? And maybe by looking or asking the question in that way, that might offer us different understandings from just saying what principles ought we abide to. 
Now this leads to interesting questions because not all of us agree on what makes a good physician. And some of us might say that there are qualities that make a fabulous surgeon, but would make a horrible nurse, right? Um, so, so how do you deal with different characteristics? And how do you deal with conflicting characteristics? There are communitarian perspectives to ethics. Communitarian derives from the French communier to make common share, common general free open to public. What do I mean by that? Here, what is good or what is right is bound up in something that is more than itself, right? Let me give you a, a, an example. Uh, a narrative ethics is an example of a communitarian perspective to ethics. There are some stories that we can recount and we can say, you know what, that was good at the end of the day. And people will say, well, what was good about it? Oh, it's not really how it ended. It's not really, you know, the characteristics of the different actors or people within it. It's not even necessarily the principles that guided their actions. It's rather how everything held together. In the end, as a program, we can tell the story of taking care of this particular child, even if the end didn't end up as we wanted it, because it makes sense. Somehow the events in and of themselves hold together. So these are communitarian perspectives. And there's other ones that differ from narrative, which would be like relational ethics or ethics of care. Um, some examples of indigenous ethics actually you could also ask the question, would it be an example of a communitarian perspective? Um, I wanna be clear, I'm not talking about what makes an entertaining story. I'm rather talking about what makes something good in the sense of this is a story that we can share with others. What about contractualist perspectives? So contractualism um, basically says that we would create morality by our agreements with one another. So there is nothing good or nothing bad until we form an agreement with one another. So if I make an agreement with uh, Dr. Solez and I say, um, Kim, I will be there on Thursday to teach your class. We form that agreement. If I don't live up to that agreement, then I've committed something that isn't moral, right? because we agreed to that in advance. Contractualism often appears within medicine in the sense of like informed consent conversations. And that's why in informed consent conversations, it's so important that there's, um, you know, full disclosure of information, right? That people feel free to uh, participate or, or withdraw or pursue a particular treatment and that they have capacity to understand the consequences of taking or not taking a particular intervention. What about kaziatry? Kaziatry is an example also of a perspective-based ethics, whereby morality is not viewed as something out there, but rather in the peculiarities of the case, recognizing that cases can be reinterpreted over time. Um, in some ways, uh, kaziatry perspectives are a bit like uh, communitarian perspectives in the sense of it's how everything holds together. On the other hand, there's also the sense of saying, well, something previously was considered right, and this is very similar to that, so it's also considered right. So to give you an example, we previously performed heart surgery on a baby with trisomy 18, uh, and as a program, we agreed that that was reasonable. So surely it must be right to do it again. Now, um, you'll see examples of kaziatry in like health law or, or ju jurisprudence, right? Where what is right is defined by looking at previous judgments on different kinds of cases. But we still have to deal with the potential disconnect that what is isn't always the same as what ought to be. So I, I'm tried by showing you those different perspectives to just give you a sense of there's different ways of actually starting to reason or question what is good and what is bad. And I'm hoping that these different perspectives can be employed as heuristics or said differently tools 
when you're looking at different kind of situations, cases, examples, topics, issues, concerns within technology of medicine and future of medicine. My last take home point, um, I wanna make sure I finish with uh, in the next 10 minutes, is that reflection and discussion can support moral actions. So, ethic, I wrote this down, so I remember how I said it. Ethics exist as a discipline precisely because the rightness and wrongness of our actions cannot simply be reduced to reasoning and calculation. If I could tell you every time this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, there wouldn't be a discipline of ethics. It's rather that we're dealing with situations where there often are more than one possible responses that may be deemed possibly right or wrong. And that's the reason that ethics is a discipline. So how do we in clinical practice deal with these kind of ethical situations? The first is that we recognize the existence of a moral ethical situation. So, you know, the example of the case that I opened everything up with today, Daniel, this little baby with trisomy 18. This is an ethical situation because we're confronted with a situation of having to make a decision for a child, right? A child that hasn't even come into this world independently from its, its mother, right? And we're making a decision as healthcare providers, not for that child, but hopefully supporting the family to make the decision that they deem is as right recognizing that we may all have different boundaries as far as what is a potentially right or reasonable decision. So we need to recognize that we're dealing with potentially different perspectives. I'd say the next thing that we tend to do is we adopt some kind of a questioning attitude where what do you think it might be like for that parent, right? What might it be like for the surgeon being asked to, you know, take a child for surgery who may only live a, a short period of time, right? What are the different perspectives of a particular situation? Does a fetus potentially experience pain if we end the pregnancy at this particular time? We tend to enlist colleagues or other health professionals in discussion, not only to gain a better sense of different perspectives, but also to question our own perspective and our own judgments. Many of us harbor individual biases, right? With regards to what we feel is a meaningful life or a right way of living. We try and make moral questions explicit by drawing on different moral ethical perspectives. Well, one way of looking at this situation is from a consequentialist perspective. What ends are we trying to um, achieve here, right? Or what principles seem to be important in this situation? What would it mean to respect the autonomy in this situation? Does a fetus have autonomy? How do we respect a mother's autonomy to make decisions for her unborn child? What obligations do we have to support someone to increase their autonomy? We have to clarify our understandings of the language used to articulate questions. If we talk about surgery as being futile, uh, and saving the life of um, a child with trisomy 18, um, is that because it has actually no effect? Or because it just does, all it does is keep them alive for a little bit longer, but maybe not what we tend to think of as a, a full and long life. And then we tend to identify reasonable courses of action, recognizing that in the same situation, we might take different situations, which in itself can lead to moral distress and other kinds of senses of discomfort within a team. Uh, when you see that you're caring for one patient in one way and a different patient a different way, get them being in the same intensive care unit or other clinical environment and having seemingly similar diagnoses. Okay, that was way more talking than I planned. It's 307 on the dot. Those are the take home points that I was hoping to go through. 
we have, I think, a good 15 minutes for any kinds of questions, uh, comments, discussion. And I'm also just going to put up my email address here. It sounds like we're not going on strike. So it sounds like my we email are. is still going to work for <laughs> a few <Yeah>. months. <laughs> yeah. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we just have time for a discussion and questions. Yeah, I am very happy about uh, the lectures that you do because, you know, it seems to me from the title of this course, <laughs> there should be some lectures that are definitely medical, right? And, and at the present time, you come as close to that as uh, anyone who's currently teaching in, in the course. Shauna Pandya, some of her space medicine is, is, is close to, but still quite, quite accessible. To, so I'm, 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 I'm proud to have this content. And I think it is understandable to everybody they may not know all, all the terms, but I mean, I mean, what you're talking about generally is, I think, quite easy for everyone to uh, understand. So, and 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 it's something that they would all care about too. You know, <laughs> it's like something that somebody cannot have an opinion about. It seems to me that that's just not possible, Ms. Sarah. Okay, I'll I'll quiet down so that others can, can speak. So I guess it goes without saying, but I noticed like empathy is is basically fundamental when it comes to ethics. And I'm sure everyone's seen the trolley problem a million times, and most times no one has an answer to it. But it was interesting that you laid out those different perspectives like the consequential perspective or the one that was just based on the action perspective. So under those perspectives, I guess there would be an answer for the trolley problem. It would just be different for each of those perspectives. Is that how one could see it? I, I think the things like the trolley problem are really helpful from a, an education perspective to basically say, how would someone who takes on a deontological perspective look at the trolley problem how would they come to a conclusion of how to act right um compared to from a consequentialist perspective or a character perspective right so i think don't get me wrong i think the character problem the violinist problem you know there's tons of these problems they're useful from that perspective um as far as helping us understand what is consequentialism, right? So a consequentialist clearly would say, yeah, don't have any qualms, hit the lever, right? You wanna save the most lives possible. That's the right thing to do. There is no real ethical dilemma here, right? But say a phenomenological perspective to ethics, which I didn't talk about, but actually ask the question, well, is there a moral difference to, to pulling in a lever compared to not of implicating yourself within the action? Now we maybe do have a dilemma because there's something different about standing by compared to pulling the lever and, and acting, right? Um, so I, I do think that um, those trolley problems can be helpful, but if all you do is look at trolley problems, if all you do is sit in like a, an office chair and lecture on ethics to philosophy students, I worry you're missing something. Because like you said, there is this notion of what's it like to be there. Um, now you use the term empathy, right? Empathy is usually regarded as putting yourself in someone else's situation, right? Now you could say to be em empathetic is actually the most unethical, unethical thing to do because you're essentially saying, I can understand this other person's situation by putting myself in it, right? Rather than stepping back and saying there are aspects of this experience that I won't be able to understand because I haven't had the same lived experience as them or don't find myself in the world in the same way. So there is something deeply ethical about empathy, but also something unethical about empathy as well, if that makes sense. Wow. Wow. Completely new concepts to me. So. 
So, you know, I need to get your background. I don't know where to get it from, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, pigs are, are very topical now because of uh, Zeno transplants. And, and so it just happens to be the best. But it's um, actually an illustration, illustration of lipstick on a pig which is a metaphor, you know, for like, if you have a very, very old house and you paint it or, or something, you know? So, so it uh, morally can't go way beyond pigs. Yeah. I got, I got interviewed on Ryan Jesperson about the Xeno transplantation. That was interesting. Yeah. You should all listen to Real Talk. Yeah, <laughs> well. Uja, you your on. The, the first pig heart went to an uh, ex-con who had stabbed somebody seven times and, and they didn't die right, right away. It was years, you know, of, of, of uh, consequences of that action. So it's something very troubling. On the other hand, we're trying to make up rules for this new situation of these kinds of organs that represent a risk of the unknown where it doesn't make sense to give them to recipients who are completely able to receive regular organs, regular human organs, right? So you're trying to pick this other, other category, you know? Yeah, so. There's the um, famous with the neonatology of this is of course the story of baby Faye, right? So that's a little baby in the um, mid eighties who got a baboon heart uh, right. for hypoplastic heart syndrome. And uh, it's often referenced in oh, that Paul Simon song. I don't remember now which one, but um, yeah, it-, it you, you can Xenotransplantation. Yeah. Yeah. There it is, yeah. yeah. It's um, xenotransplantation isn't new, right? But on the other hand, um, when we begin to modify the animals for it to become acceptable for our own body, right? When we make an animal more like us in order to use its organs, that introduces some really interesting ethical dimensions, right? Because we're continuing to treat something as different from us. So it's okay to just kill an animal and take its heart for organ transplantation but we've made it more like us, but it's still okay. So how much like us can we make it before it becomes not okay, right? So it's, yeah. um, I, I think the ethics behind xenotransplantation are fascinating. It'd be lovely to do um, like a really interactive class once on it. Yeah, well, I think that will happen. I'm in a situation where I'm writing things about it what I'm basically saying is that xenotransplantation is an interim situation until we can perfect stem cell generated organs. And when that works, then we will no longer be able to justify uh, what we're doing to pigs. So that this only makes sense un un until, um, regenerative medicine really gets all the kinks worked out. And those kinks are very pathological. In other words, what is it that regenerative medicine can't do? It can't replicate the parts of organs you cannot have a scaffold for, like the interstitial, right? You can't at, at the present time get the right cells to do the right things in, in the, the very fine pathology between the big structures. So like in the kidney, you, you can probably make glomeruli and vessels okay, but the stuff in between is, is just not possible to, to replicate what should be there. But you, you can imagine, therefore, that it's, it, it's not going to be that long. I mean, maybe 15 years, something like that, where, before we're at the point where we can just culture cells and make complex organs. 
And at that point then, all, all these things that make us uncomfortable, like the fact, I don't know if this is true, but like the, the animal rights people say that mother pigs sing to their children and <laughs> you know, like the mental life of, 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 of pigs and they're, 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 they're you know, affectionate with each other. They're really clever. If you show a pig a mirror that shows there's food off to one side, the pig will be able to detect that this is not really where the food is, but given what mirrors do, the food must be over there. And, and it figures that out pretty quickly, but it's pre-verbal, right? So like it can't understand things like we are breeding you for, uh, you know, financial benefit. We're, we're making an industry out of taking your organs and giving it the, uh, the because they're pre verbal, they, they can't understand those things. So humans need to sort of act for pigs, right? We need to take moral actions because we do understand what we're doing to them and they really are unable. But it's not that they don't have feelings at all. And, and so where, what, 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 it, it's, it's never going to be completely comfortable, I think, to use pig organs. But given the various options, if you look at transplantation at the moment, we don't talk about it like this, but it really is. We ha only have enough organs for 10% of the people who need them. And the, most of the rest of the patients die waiting. I mean, it may be decades, but that, that's sort of what happens over either a short or a long period of time. So the current status of transplantation is not logical. It's an unsatisfactory medical procedure. As soon as you factor in pigs, <laughs> it becomes logical, right? Because now you have enough organs for everybody. Well, not really. You don't have enough organs for the pigs that you took them from, Kim. So, well, I mean, with, this is where it comes down to perspective, right? Right. right. And so this is all the, the challenge, right? If we're judging, um, you know, other species based on ourselves as a frame of reference, right? I don't right. see people going around taking organs from severely disabled human beings who are not no. verbal, who are wheelchair bound, who oh. may have a different kind of grasp of the world around them. Yeah. Um, we don't do that. Why is that? Because they are born into a certain class which we have decided is human. And it would right. be really confusing to somehow say that some humans have different moral worth compared to others. Right. Compared to pigs, you know, they were only in Charlotte's Web, right? That was a fictional story, wasn't it? Well, I mean, you know, yeah. even if they aren't verbal, that doesn't mean there isn't some Right. experiential capacity of the world. So with, with kidneys, we have two kidneys, pigs have two kidneys. So, you know, the, the lifelong, I've sort of been oriented around this family cabin we have in Bradford, Vermont. And, and I've written a fictional account of what's gonna happen now between 2022 and 2045 which is that's going to be a sort of playground for pigs who have given one kidney. So they've saved a human life and, the, and they get this, this great landscape that I'm very familiar with to spend the rest of their lives just having fun, you know? So, so that's one potential outcome, um, but I don't know. Let's see what happens. Oh, and it's, I mean, again, again, not to pick on your cabin, but <laughs> we might feel better about ourselves because we've now given a home to these pigs. Right. But isn't it kind of ethically problematic that we have people who have vacation properties 
in the context of significant populations of sure. our world who don't yeah. have a home to go to, right? right? Like, so this is again where ethics, I would say for this class, it's not always about saying what is just right, what is wrong. It's right. rather about bringing different perspectives to open yes. up an issue. Yep. Because Kim and I might not see eye to eye on, on everything, but on the other hand, we can both agree there are these different perspectives that we can consider. Yeah, but I think that the morality of what we're doing to cultured cells is intrinsically less troubling than what we're doing to pigs. And <laughs> so like the, those, those cells, they, they can replicate themselves. You know, we don't have to constantly renew the animals they come from. They, 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 they could go for decades. And so when we reach that point, we'll have a much better situation than we have during the period when we're using pig organs. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't use pig organs. But yeah, it, it's going to be troubling at a certain level the entire time that we're using them. It, it is really tough if we can be in a current situation and say, this won't be okay when we look back on right. it, but we're gonna <laughs> rationalize it. Right. And I'm sure that there were times in, in our history where people said, this behavior isn't going to be okay. We can rationalize it right now because, you know, we otherwise treat this segment of the population in this way. Um, but in the future, we're not going to be able to look back on this positively. So right. um, one, it's, one thing it's, that I never okay. see written about is when dueling ended. How did it end? Because there must have been proposals we shouldn't have dueling anymore. If I slap you with a glove, that doesn't mean we can then be a certain number of paces apart. We both aim at the other person and one of us dies, right? So how, how did that end? There must have been discussions, you know, this is stupid. We shouldn't do this anymore, right? Yeah. That's just another moral quandary that's not much written about today. Um, I'm, I'm realizing Kim and I have talked a little bit too much between ourselves. Are there other comments or questions from other people are here? Pooja, I saw you had your camera on for a second. I'm sorry about that. Um, Ms. Uh, Cody, so forth. Actually, like uh, I've been attending Dr. Sole's class, like cinematic classes since like many, three years now, but like I really enjoyed your class today, especially the ethical, like maybe because it because, because of the initial like slides you had about the child Daniel, you know, like uh, when uh, these days, like most of the women, they tend to have the babies after 30. So there are many things like you know, that come up like many disorders that the babies may have and also there are so many things that you have to decide and you're not able to decide like what is ethically right and wrong so it really i really like that portion yeah. thank you thanks Natasha. yeah you have a beautiful baby there he looks a little <laughs> tired <laughs> he just woke up there you go yeah so any comments from Cody or Mispa? Um, yeah, so I think that this is a very interesting lecture um, because I'm like I am in an education degree. So this is kind of kind of new and fascinating for me. But um, we have a few ethical classes like that we have to take in education. So it's interesting because we also discuss kind of the trolley problem there and like the different kind of ways of thinking about it. But I agree that I think like multiple perspectives is definitely important um, because in our debate too, like there was no one right answer where like in my mind, I feel like I would have switched the track to go for one and save the four. But like, it's interesting that people just like don't agree with that. Cause I'm like, oh wow. Like I kind of value like the bigger like amount of people but some people see it as like, you're then like basically doing that person's fade. Um, so I think that that's like a super interesting dilemma to have to think about. If you have a chance um, in your program to take a, a class by uh, Catherine Adams, she was teaching a lovely uh, pedagogy technology class, which deals with a lot of the ethics in education. 
Oh, cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I always, um, as a medical student, I've had a couple lectures from Dr. Uh, Van Madden and um, his ethics lectures, they're always very interesting. And I think he's he's presented us some of this information before, but it's um, it's always good to hear it again, rethink about it. And um, I still don't know where I land on some of the issues, but it's, I guess that's part of ethics is just reanalyzing and uh, reflecting on the issue. What I always felt is in this course, you can't have too much ethics. I mean, sometimes we, we've had the, the uh, ethicists coming to absolutely every session and there seem to be valid ethical issues every single session. So yeah, there can't be too much ethics. And I think it's, it's you, you can't hear these things too often, right? Because there aren't any real answers, right? So, so if it, 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 it's not like, well, I heard that before, so I already know the answer. <laughs> that isn't the point of this. Yeah. So. Okay, so um, I think we've, we've had a great session. This is, I think the first time I've ever been purposefully late. I don't know if that's going to happen again, but what I was doing in the other Zoom session was sort of crucial to the next stages of Xeno transplant. So, so that's why I was late. So in, in a way it was ethical also there. So so anyway, and, and, and it's nice that this turned out so well Without me there at the beginning, I guess we always do that I wasn't really necessary, but today was the first time that we had, had the proof of that. So that's good. So uh, thank you very much, Michael, and we look forward to your next lecture. And I'm so glad that this, uh, there's no longer a threatened strike. So our life is a little bit more certain than we thought. Yeah. We'll see you on Tuesday. Sounds good. Okay, bye-bye. <clears throat>